Good morning. Welcome to Destiny Fellowship. Uh, we hope you are ready to get into the Word of the Lord. We hope you've been worshiping along with our worship team today. Uh, we expect to go back to our sanctuary in a few weeks, but until then, we're going to continue to worship and get into the Word together just as we have been these last few months uh, here online. We're so glad you joined us. Uh, welcome. We want to make sure you get a Bible, get a notepad. If you don't have a Bible next to you, uh, use an app. Uh, use Google, whatever you got to do uh, to have Matthew chapter 13 ready to go. Uh, we continue our series today on the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we were in Matthew 13 looking at the parable of the sower. Today we're going to continue in Matthew 13 looking at the parable of the wheat and the tares. We are in Matthew 13 want you to turn there with us, and we're going to read verses 24 through 30. Uh, would somebody please help us in the comment section uh, with Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Come on, let's read together this morning. It says, Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while the men were sleeping... His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore again, then the tares became evident also. Verse 27 says, The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares or weeds? Verse 28 says, And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you might uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat in my barn. Gather the wheat in my barn. I want to preach for a little while using as a subject, While you were sleeping. While you were sleeping. Again, I want to remind you that last week we were in Matthew 13 looking at the parable of the sower. You remember he sowed into four different grounds and we identified those grounds as the wayside and uh, the stony places and the thorns and some fell on good ground. It was the seed that fell on good ground that brought forth a harvest, some 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. If you remember also last week, we saw that the parables in Matthew 13 all seem to build on each other. For this reason, it seems that Christ refers to the parable of the sower as the fundamental, as the most basic of understanding all of the other parables. And so we're going to continue to build on that now. And I want to just bring out a few things to you. The reason that we're studying parables right now is because not only do they have spiritual truth for our life, but many of the parables have strong implications for the last days or the end times. And as we mentioned before, I don't know about you, but it's plain to see from a biblical perspective that we are indeed in the last days. If you believe that, say amen. I want you to consider the etymology of the word parable for a second with me. Parable is made up of two words. It is para and bole, B-O-L-E. Para means alongside or next to. Uh, bole means to throw or to place. And so I want you to think of a parable as the Lord's teaching methods, the Lord's teaching device, where he would take a concept and he would throw or place another concept that we're familiar with right next to it so that we could compare and understand the other. For example, Jesus says, I, I want you to understand the kingdom of God. And so that we can understand it, he places a mustard seed next to it and says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. You see, that's what the parables do for us. They, they provide comparisons. They give us extended metaphors and similes and understanding what Christ is trying to portray. So he says the kingdom of God is like a net. He, he places a dragnet next to it. Or the kingdom of God is like a pearl of great price. And he throws or places a pearl right next to the kingdom so that we can understand its truths. In this particular instance, he's still talking about the kingdom. 
and he says the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sows good seed in his field and yet someone else comes and sows bad seed or tares. Uh, we don't use that word tares often, so if you prefer, just use the word weeds. Notice in this field there is wheat and there are weeds. I want to treat this passage in an expositional fashion. and I want to go almost verse by verse explaining the content of this parable. I need your help taking notes with me. Uh, here is our first point, if you're ready. Just two words. Here's our first point. Men slept. Men slept. Notice in the passage, the Bible explains that the sower is sowing good seed in his field. And one of the things I appreciate about many of the parables is that we don't have to guess its interpretation. In fact, in this self-same parable, Christ gives his own interpretation of what each element represents. In fact, if you want to look later on in the chapter in verses 37 and 38, he explains to us that the sower is himself. It says the sower is the son of man. If you remember last week, the seed was the word of God. But there's a little subtle change now because in this parable, he explains that the seed is the sons of the kingdom. That's you and I. Come on, somebody say, that's you and I. We are the seeds of the kingdom that the master has sown into his field. Now that might sound a little strange, but uh, it's an a biblical, you'll see this in the biblical narrative over and over again. For example, somebody once said, if you want an oak tree, then sow an acorn. They went on to say, if you want a forest, then you have to sow many acorns. But if you want to sow many forests, then you have to sow into a person that's going to help you create more forest. And the same concept is seen in the life and death and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In those three and a half years on the earth, what was he doing? He didn't open a synagogue. He didn't open a church. He didn't create business cards. What did he do? He sowed into people so that after his ascension, they would sow into others who would sow into others who would sow into others. What we find here is that not only is Christ the seed, in fact, he says in John chapter 12 that his death, his crucifixion and resurrection uh, was emblematic of a seed going into the ground. In John 12, 24, he said, unless the seed goes into the ground and dies, it cannot bring forth fruit. But I want you to see now that this passage isn't just referring to Christ as a seed that is sown into the earth, but He's also explaining that you and I are like seeds that the master has sown into the world because he goes on to say in John 12 and verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it and he who is willing to give up his life will find eternal life. The next verse says that if we want to be servants of him, then we must follow him. What does that mean? It means we are to be like Christ. We are to do what Christ did. What did Christ do? He was that seed that the Father planted into the earth. He willingly gave his life so that he could bring forth much fruit. This carries over into our relationship with God. This carries over into discipleship so that every single day, even though Christ has been crucified, you and I are also to take up our cross and deny ourselves and die to ourselves, so that we too can bring forth much fruit. The problem here is that while the Lord has sown good seed into the field, the scripture says that his servants fell asleep. His servants should have been guarding. His servants should have been protecting the seed that was sown. No wonder Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Timothy, guard the treasure, guard the deposit that has been entrusted to you. Here's our first point. I gave it to you already. Men slept. Instead of guarding, they were found sleeping. You find all throughout history, all throughout the biblical narrative that when somebody fell asleep on the, on the job, usually it had bad consequences. If you were born in Houston like I was, if you're a, a Texas native, then growing up in maybe HISD or one of the surrounding school districts, you were taught Texas history. And you remember the Texans' defeat at Goliad and the Texans' defeat at the Alamo, but you read about the victory at the Battle of San Jacinto where Sam Houston and his armies attacked the Mexican armies. And the reason they were successful, watch this, 
is because in the middle of the day, Santa Anna and his troops were found sleeping. Men slept. And because they were taking a siesta, Sam Houston and his armies were successful in attacking and defeating the army. In the same way in this parable, because men slept, the enemy was able to sow bad seed where God had sown good seed. Are you with me so far? In fact, all throughout scripture, that's what you see. Was it not Samson who was asleep that allowed Delilah to cut his hair and he lost his strength? Was it not in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus said to the disciples, watch and pray with me lest you enter into temptation, but they were overcome with sleep? Do you remember Eutychus in the book of Acts? While Paul is preaching, he's sitting on the windowsill and because he falls asleep, he fell out of the window to his death. My question this morning is, is have you fallen asleep on the job? Have you fallen asleep since we started this whole thing in March? Have you fallen asleep because you only know how to worship in a sanctuary? Have you gotten spiritually sleepy because you don't like doing Bible study on Zoom? Or maybe you've fallen asleep simply because you've grown tired. You're, you're tired of this situation and tired of one thing after another in 2020 and tired of the way things are and tired of our situation. And maybe you've just grown sleepy. I, I want to be your alarm clock this morning. I want to wake you up and say, be careful because if you sleep too long, there's an enemy that's ready to sow bad seed into your field. It reminds me in the book of Proverbs that we are to guard our fields. We are to watch over our homes. We are to take care of the territory that God has entrusted to us. You see in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 30, the proverb says, I walked past the house of the lazy man or the fool or the procrastinator. The King James calls him the sluggard. Watch this in Proverbs 24 and verse 30. If you're taking notes, you need this one. Proverbs 24 verse 30, he says, I walked past the house of the lazy man and his field was overgrown with weeds uh, because he fell asleep. Thorns and weeds were able to grow up in his field. He goes on to say that the stone wall had been torn down. What does that mean? It means the enemy now had free reign and access to come and sow whatever he wanted to sow in his field. The reason for this, if you keep on reading Proverbs 20, 24, he explained, explains that the disposition of the foolish man was a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Be careful, my dear brothers and sisters, that you don't fall asleep in this season. This is not the time to let up, to shut up. This is a time, on the contrary, to wake up, to stand up, to be mindful, to be sober, to be vigilant. There is an adversary who desires nothing more than to destroy and abolish the work of God in your life. There is an adversary whose modus operandi is to destroy your marriage, to destroy your ministry, to destroy your relationship with God, to destroy your children. And if we're not careful and if we fall asleep, we allow him to come into our field and to sow bad seed. If this makes sense, say amen. Now notice that as the story progresses. He's comparing this parable with the previous parable. Because notice, not only is it enough to be good ground, not only do we have to be good ground, we have to guard our ground. Friends, you've got to guard your house. You've got to guard your prayer life. You have to guard your Bible study time. You have to guard your calling. You, you have to guard your anointing. Man, I wish y'all were in this room with me. You have to guard what God has placed on the inside of you. Our first point, watch this, men slept. Here's our second one. Men slept. Secondly, the enemy sowed. The enemy sowed. I'm convinced had the men not fallen asleep, the enemy would not have been able to sow. Nevertheless, we understand from the interpretation that Jesus gives us in verses 38 and 39. You can look ahead if you need to. He identifies that the bad seed is the sons of the adversary. He explains and identifies. He calls him out by name. He says the one who is sowing the enemy, it says he's the devil. The devil is sowing bad seed. 
So notice, he tries to imitate, he tries to duplicate, he tries to copy everything that God does. That's been the narrative from the beginning of Scripture. He is the great imposter. He is the great counterfeit. He is the fake, phony, fraudulent. He is a cheap knockoff. He's an unbranded purse from Harwin. Notice everything that God does, the enemy tries to impersonate. We see over and over again that he'll give you a counterfeit option of what God offers in truth. For example, in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, we see counterfeit Christians. Jesus said, excuse me, Paul said, I was among false brethren, false Christians, people who said they were Christians and they weren't. They were a counterfeit version. Notice there is a counterfeit gospel in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. Notice the enemy offers a counterfeit righteousness in Romans 10, verses 1 through 3. Did you know the enemy, the adversary, even has a counterfeit congregation, a synagogue of Satan, as it were, in Revelation 2 and verse 9? I came to tell you this morning, not just to wake up, not just to don't fall asleep. Here's what I came to tell you this morning. Don't settle for a cheap knockoff. What God has to give you is enough. What God has to give you is sufficient. In fact, what God has to give you is more than enough. Don't settle for a cheap imitation that the enemy offers. If you're just joining us, we're looking at the parable of the weed and the wheats as found in Matthew 13. Now notice any student of the Torah will recognize in reading this parable of the wheat and the tares or the wheat and the weeds. Any student of the Torah will notice that this is a direct violation of God's law. You see in Deuteronomy 22 verses 9 through 11, it says, Do not plow an ox with a donkey. He says, In those days you couldn't even wear a garment that had two different types of fabric woven together. And then he goes on to say, And you cannot sow two different types of seeds in the same field. Stay with me here. Let me say that again. According to Deuteronomy 22 and verse 9, it was sin. It was against God's law to sow two different kinds of seeds in the same field. That that passage is referred to the Kilaim laws. Those are laws of separation. It seems like the enemy is always trying to mix and to mingle If you remember in Daniel chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar sees this statue, this image uh, that represents the various empires, by the time you get to the feet, you find that it's a mixture of clay and iron, uh, trying to force two things of different natures to mix together, to dwell together, and it just doesn't happen. For this reason, we see that God's work of sanctification from Genesis to Revelation is always his will for his children. We are to come out from among them and be ye separate. But what does the enemy try to do? He tries to mix and to mingle his seed with God's seed. Man, I'm feeling this this morning. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. Now, watch this. Because of those Kilaim laws that we are to be separate, It's interesting, if you look up that word kilaim, the root word is kila, and it literally means to enclose, or a better translation is to incarcerate. You see, the reason the enemy wants to sow bad seed next to God's good seed is because he knows those thorns and that weed as it grows, it has the potential of choking out the growth, of stifling and stunting the growth of God's seed. The enemy knows he's lost many of you, but since he lost you, he's going to do everything he can to keep you from growing in the Lord. He's going to do all he can to keep you from being in your Bible, to keep you from praying, to keep you from worshiping. He's going to try to keep you from being discipled. He'll try to keep you from discipling others. He'll try to keep you from being adamant and bold about your faith and your relationship with God. Why? Because he's sowing bad seed next to God's good seed. So notice in verse 28, the landowner looks at his field and he realizes there is wheat and there is weeds that have grown. And the servants say, Master, what should we do about this? Notice his reply in verse 28. He says, an enemy has done this. Would you say that with me? An enemy has done this. 
He looked at his field and he saw all of the weeds and he knows he had only sown good seed. When he saw the bad seed, he said, an enemy has done this. My Lord, I, I find it significant that in the parable, Christ is warning us to be careful. Don't attribute the work of God to the work of Satan. And don't attribute the work of the enemy to God. Christ was very clear in the parable. Notice, he said, I'm responsible for the good seed. He said, but the bad seed, an enemy has done this. My dear brothers and sisters, be careful in this season to not attribute to God what the enemy has done. All of the pain and the suffering of the world, some will ignorantly blame God and defiantly and almost blasphemously look at heaven and say, how dare you do this? How dare you allow this? Friends, I want to bring it in perspective this morning. An enemy has done this. It wasn't so much that Darwin perpetuated evolution. No, an enemy has done this. It wasn't that Friedrich Nietzsche and the other nihilist philosophers proclaimed God is dead and we have killed him. No, an enemy has done this. It's not that the agnostic such as Immanuel Kant said it is virtually impossible for man to know God. No, an enemy has done this. Our nation is where it's at, not because of the right's fault or the left's fault. Watch this. An enemy has done this. We're facing the challenges we're facing today, not because of the Obama administration, not because of the Trump administration. Come on, say it with me. An enemy has done this. And so I want you to be careful. I want you to look around your life. I want you to look around your house. I want you to look at your family and be careful not to blame God, but to recognize whatever has been stolen from me, whatever has been taken from me. Whatever pain has been caused in my life and my family, it's not God. He's the God of all comfort. An enemy did that. And so I want to remind you today, oftentimes our anger needs to be refocused. That we are to take back what the enemy has stolen from us. Scripture says, for the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. Today I need you to wake up. And today I need you to make a decision that you're going to take back what the enemy has robbed you of. That it wasn't God's fault, but an enemy has done this. I've got just one more point and then I'll get out of your way. We're in Matthew 13. Notice men slept. Secondly, the enemy sowed. Here's our third one. Watch this. This is, this is the promise now. The Lord will separate. The Lord will separate. Men slept the enemy sowed, but the Lord will separate. I, I appreciate what happens in the passage because he's comparing the wheat and the tares. And I want you to fact check me. I wish I had a PowerPoint with me because I'd show you myself. But if you get a chance, I want you to Google the tares and the wheat. And I want you to look at them on the images page of Google. Uh, most scholars believe, I want to make sure I get it right, it's the genus Lolium timulentum, known as poison darnel. Others call it ryegrass or cockle. But if you notice, if you Google this and look it up, the first thing you'll see is that the wheat and the tares almost look identical. I said they almost look identical. And if you're not careful, you, you'll confuse the fake for the truth. If you're not careful, you'll confuse a lie for the truth. If you're not careful, you'll confuse gossip for gospel. If you're not careful, you'll confuse the sons of the enemy with the sons of God. If you're not careful, you'll confuse the work of the enemy with the work of God. The, the tares are almost indistinguishable. I came to tell you once more, don't settle for a cheap knockoff. But I love what happens because the servants go to the landowner and they ask him, should we root up those tares? Should we yank them out? Should we get rid of them? Should we spray some weed and feed? Notice the landowner's reply. He says, no, leave them alone because if you're yanking out the good seed, excuse me, if you're yanking out the bad seed, he says, you might damage some of the good seed as well. I want to say that again. I want you to catch this part. When the servants ask the landowner, should we yank up, should we up uproot the bad seed? The landowner said, no, because I don't want you to damage the good seed when you're yanking out the bad seed. 
here's a word for some of us this morning. It is not our job to uproot the tares. It's not our responsibility to uproot the bad seed. It is our responsibility to grow. That was a good place to say amen. Look at verse 30 with me. The landowner says, but allow them to grow. That's what I'm trying to get to. Took me 20, 25 minutes to get there. This is what I want you to understand. He says, allow them to grow. My dear brothers and sisters, in this season, it is a season to grow. To grow in your relationship with God. To grow in your prayer life. To grow in your understanding of scripture. To grow in your faith level. To grow in your anointing. He says, allow them both to grow. I dare not go through this whole episode of coronavirus and all of this pandemic and all of these changes. I dare not go through that and not grow through that. You see the difference? As this begins to settle, some of us need to understand that God has been working all along what the enemy intended for evil. God has intended for good. Someone once said, if you go through hell, you better come out on fire. If you go through hell, you better come out on fire. And so as we go through this season, we ought to be growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ought to be letting the, the things that are happening around us only add fuel to how on fire we are for God. Don't fall asleep, man of God. It's still your responsibility to guard and protect your home, your marriage, your relationship with the Lord and your children. Don't get sleepy, my dear sister. We need you on point. We need you on deck. We need you ready to fulfill God's assignment in your life. And finally, notice there is indeed a day coming. We call it the great gathering. The landowner says, don't worry, let them grow together because at that time of the harvest, in the end times, he says, I will separate the wheat from the tares. He said, the tares will be gathered together and bundled up and thrown into the fire. You know what that means. I don't have to explain it. He says, but the good seed will also be gathered, bundled up and taken to the storehouse of the master. I don't know about you, but I, I want to be in the master's barn. I want to be in the master's storehouse. I want to be in his house. I, I want to be able to say like the psalmist, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so today as we get ready to pray, I want you to look around at your field are there some areas where you've gotten lazy? Are there some areas where you've allowed some weeds to grow? Are, are you allowing some things in your field that last year you would no way have ever allowed in your house? There are some things in your personal life. There are some things in, in your thought process that, that maybe some bad seeds that the enemy has sown. Come on, today we're believing that the Lord is going to continue what he started in us. That not only are we good ground, but we're going to guard what the Lord has given us. I'll lead us, but I want you to pray. Come on, this Sunday morning, I want you to have a conversation with the Lord. If you have somebody next to you, why don't you gather them together? Bring them next to you. Grab their hand and let's pray together. Let's talk to God. Come on, this is our altar time. This is altar call. I don't know where you are. Other than driving everybody else, I want you to just stop what you're doing and let's talk to the Lord. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you have sown your word in us. We thank you that we are good ground. But Lord, you, you've given us the responsibility of guarding this field. God, I'll be the first to admit I haven't always done a good job of doing it. I need your grace. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. Father, sometimes we get sleepy. Lord, we need you to come alongside us and keep us awake. Father, give us the strength to be vigilant. Lord, I pray for every marriage, every family that's in agreement right now. Lord, I pray that you would protect them, that you would place a hedge around them, that the enemy would not be able to come in and sow seeds of destruction and seeds of pain. Lord, today we call out to you. We honor you. We bless you. We thank you. And Lord, today, if there's any that have not made a conscious decision to repent of their sins and to follow you, Lord, today is the day of salvation. And I want to invite each and every one of you, if, if you haven't repented of your sin,
And if you haven't chosen to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you can do that right now. Simply repent. Simply ask Him to forgive you of your sin. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior, and I choose to serve you. I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you said that prayer today, I I, want to know about it. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to contact you. I'd love to offer our ministry to you to do anything we can to see you continue to grow. For everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. Destiny Fellowship, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. We're going to get ready to go back to the sanctuary in two to three weeks. We'll, we'll provide an announcement soon. But until then, don't fall asleep and keep on growing. Would you join us Wednesday for our Bible study? We hope to see you there. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon.